All right, I want to talk about prayer again. Surprised by prayer. Let's turn to Acts chapter 12. Start off in verse 1. Acts 12. Now about the time Herod, the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrunians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Passover to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto Yahweh for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto an iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened unto them of his own accord. And they went out. <clears throat> and passed on through one street, forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to him, he said, Now I know of surety that the Lord has sent his angel, and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all expectations of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she cons consistently affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him, and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode. The popularity of prayer is skyrocketing. Prayer, talking about prayer, writing about prayer, exploring patterns of prayers, and the like have become more prevalent. Prayer has truly come to the forefront of our society today as more and more people are talking about seeking God's intervention in their lives. There are newspaper articles on the topic of prayer. We see images of people praying to God on television shows like Touched by an Angel. We hear folks who have gone through tragedies talking about how they prayed for God's help. Prayer has become such a hot topic that there are now folks who are talking and writing about personal benefits of prayer. In an article of Christianity Today magazine, there was an article entitled, Doctors Who Pray, in which several medical doctors expounded upon the medical benefits of prayer for their patients. Dr. Dale Matthews, an internist and associate professor of medicine at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C., 
is one of the growing number of medical professionals who are discovering the medical benefits of faith and prayer. Dr. Matthews and other doctors are beginning to scientifically study the effects of prayer on illnesses and in, in, injuries. In the article of this, this story, Dr. Matthews says scientific knowledge has demonstrated the positive benefits of religion. I can say as a physician and scientist, not just as a Christian, that scientifically prayer is good for you. The medical effects of faith on health are not a matter of faith, but of science. There was an article at that time. Because of the way we, are, we as a people are, any time we learn of something that is going to benefit us personally, in some way, you can bet there will be many who will jump on the bandwagon. I'm deeply concerned about how prayer is being portrayed and about how Yahweh is being reduced into some kind of celestial Santa Claus whose primary function is to dole out what we want when we want it. If we understand prayer as simply a means to get what we want and to align ourselves with the man upstairs, who can work the system for us we are totally missing out on the true purpose of prayer. The consequences of this type of understanding of prayer are catastrophic. Imagine with me for a minute, we go to the intensive care unit in the children's hospital where mom and dad are anxiously waiting news of their precious child whose life is hanging in the balance. The little boy is fighting for his life. The doctors are doing everything humanly possible to save the little boy's life. People are praying all over town and the child's health to be restored. Suddenly the doctor appears from behind the doors with his head hanging down and discouragement written all over his face. He walks over to the mother and father, sits down and takes the mom's hand and says, I'm so sorry. We did everything we could, but we weren't able to keep your son alive. What is the mother and father going to be led to believe? Where will they turn? What will they do? If they have been reading many of the pop culture books on prayer, or they have been listening to a preacher who has taught them that all you have to do is ask and God will give you what you ask for, then they are in trouble. Their faith will crumble into a heap of ruins. This little scenario takes place every day in different situations all across the country. In May 1st, 1990, cable television giant Ted Turner accepted an award given by the American Humanist Association for his work on behalf of the environment and world peace. At the banquet, Turner told the captive audience that he had a strict Christian upbringing and at one time considered becoming a missionary. Turner told the crowd that he had been saved seven or eight times as a child, but that he became disenchanted with Christianity after his sister died, despite his prayers. Turner said, the more he strayed from the faith, the better I felt. That's a tragedy. I can't tell you how troubled I felt when I read that story about Ted Turner and learned that the, he had abandoned his faith because of his misunderstanding of the purpose of prayer. I don't know what you think of Turner, but it can hardly be refuted that he is a brilliant man. What a tragedy to learn that his brilliance, which has been used to build a television empire, could have been used to further the cause of the kingdom of Yahweh. There is power in prayer. Prayer does work, but not in the way it is being portrayed today. The purpose of prayer is not to benefit us by getting us what we want, to lower our cholesterol count or heart rate, or to allow us to get back to at those who have gotten under our skin. 
The purpose of prayer is to draw us closer to the heart of the Father so that our wills, our deepest desires, our passions will be those of the Father and not our own. When we draw close to the heart of the Father, then He will be glorified through our lives. Our words, our works done for His glory. People are becoming more interested in prayer so that they can reap personal benefits. But there's an equally devastating practice happening among us today. There are many of us who, with no expectation of Yahweh honoring our prayers or acting on our behalf, we are engaged in an empty ritual, sometimes with zeal and fervency, but we certainly never expect anything to happen to turn the situation around. I don't think that we are the first generation to walk away from eloquently worded prayers expecting nothing to happen. In our study that we just read, we see how there are many believers in the early church who prayed fervently for Simon Peter. But, when, but then when Yahweh answered their prayers, they couldn't believe that he really acted on their behalf. If you look at what we just read in Acts 12, verse 1 through 19, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intended to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with his sword, and he saw that it pleased the Jews, so he proceeded to seize Peter. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After he arrested him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to Yahweh for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up and said, quick, get up. He said, the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter followed him out to prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision, a dream perhaps. They passed their first and second guards, came by the iron gate leading to the city. It opened to them by itself. They went through it, and when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left. Peter came to himself and says, Now I know, without a doubt, that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's crutches and everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door, and when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without even opening the door. And she exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel then. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. 
This is a tragic comedy at best. It is tragic from the standpoint that the church had been praying fervently. They were focused on praying for Peter because they understood the gravity of the situation. You need to understand as we get into this story that Harold was a ruthless leader who wanted nothing more than to win popular approval. He was willing to pull up, <clears throat> sorry, he was willing to pull up the, to the next one who would give him more power and he was willing to exterminate all of his allies' enemies to gain a few more votes. Harold came from a long line of ruthless leaders. His grandfather, Harold the Great, was so barbarous that he executed one of his wives, her mother, and three of his sons, the last just five days before his death. Shortly before his death, he, he lured prominent Jewish leaders to Jericho where he had them put into prison. He knew the people were not going to shed a tear, many tears for him So, when he died, so he ordered that when he died, the Jewish leaders were to be killed as well as a demonstration of their lack of respect for Harold the Great, they didn't follow through with his plans. Probably the most heinous of all of his crimes was the killing of all the male children in Bethlehem. You find that in Matthew 2 verse 16 in order to try to get rid of the baby Yeshua. Harold that we are looking at is the grandson of this man, Harold the Great. Herod Agrippa I reigned from 37 A.D. to 44 A.D. And he followed in the footsteps of his grandfather who had murdered his own son. Herod Agrippa's father and had brought terror into the hearts of the people. Herod Agrippa was uh, suspect in the eyes of the Romans as they had never truly put their trust behind him. But because of Herod's friendship with Caligula, he was named king and given the area north of Galilee to rule. In 39 AD, Caligula extended Agrippa's rule by giving him Galilee and Perea. Finally, when Calig Caligula was named emperor in 41 AD, Herod was given the entire area of Judea and Samaria, an area ruled by Romans for 35 years. Herod Agrippa was a powerful man but he knew in his heart that he was trusted and admired by neither the Romans nor the Jews. To try to gain the trust of the Jews, Herod Agrippa was always trying to win their favor. One way to get the good graces of the Jews people was to persecute the hated Christians. And as we come to today's section of scripture, we find that Herod Agrippa had already had John, the brother of James, put to death by the sword. He then had ordered the arrest of Simon Peter to try and gain further approval of the Jewish leaders. There was a very good reason why Herod Agrippa chose the week of celebration of the Passover. There was lots of Jewish people present to see his act of defiance towards the Christians, an act of alliance with Jews. There's little doubt that Herod was planning on having Peter executed as soon as the celebration ended. Herod wanted to make sure that Peter did not escape and he had, as he had done once before in Acts 5 verse 18. So he had Peter guarded by four squads of soldiers. The four squads of guards consisted of four guards each and they would rotate on their watch every four hours around the clock. Herod had to arrest, had to rest well at night knowing that there was no possible way that Peter was going to escape this time. At any given time, there were two men chained to Peter as he sat in his locked cell. At the same time, there was two other guards stationed outside the cell just in case he got by the two guards that were chained to him. I think we could say that it was a hopeless situation for Peter. The executioner's sword wouldn't be needed to be put away for another day. The crowds weren't going to show up 
only to be turned away because of another hairy Houdini-like escape by Peter. The end was near and the guards would assure that Harold's bloodthirsty appetite would be quenched. So let's switch venues and moved from the locked tight cell holding Peter to the little house of uh, John Mark's mother where there were followers of Yeshua praying for Peter. These folks weren't just remembering Peter at their bedtime prayers. They were praying fervently for him. The Greek word fervent uh, ectonies stretched out intent earnestly which is a term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limits. The same Greek word used here of the way in which the followers of Yeshua were praying for Peter is used in Luke 22 verse 44 for the way in which Yeshua prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke writes, and being in, in anguish he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. You can easily see that the believers weren't playing with prayer. They were praying. When was the last time you prayed in such a way about a situation? When was the last time you were stretched to the breaking point in your prayer life? When is the last time you passionately and with such great commitment gave yourself to the labor of prayer? I'm convinced that we should pray with such fervency. I believe that we should follow the example of the followers of the early church who labored in prayer over Peter. But I'm also concerned that we labor with expectations. From studying the story of, of the great escape of Peter from Herod's prison, I've come to the conclusion that those who were praying for Peter didn't really anticipate Peter avoiding the executioner's side. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at our scriptures once again, and we look what is happening. Uh, 12. Got mixed up. <laughs> locked in a jail cell with two burly linebacker types locked to his wrist. An angel enters Peter's locked tight doom and brings deliverance. After Peter is outside and down the road, the angel disappeared. Sounds like a scene scripted for a touch by an angel. What a great story. It's not the craftiness of Peter that got him out of jail. Peter was asleep when the angel came. It wasn't the sympathy of the jailers that enabled Peter to find deliverance. They would later lose their lives over Peter's escape. There was no explanation for Peter's escape except for the power of Yahweh. It was the power of Yahweh that sent the angel. It was the power of Yahweh that loosed the chains. It was the power of Yahweh that opened the iron gate. It was the power of Yahweh. Once free, Peter came to his senses and arrived at the same conclusion in verse 11. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. It was the power of Yahweh. Peter made his way to the house of John Mark's mother, Mary. I want you to see firsthand what transpired. Peter arrived at Mary's house from verses 12 to 16. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and the servant girl came, Rhoda came and answered the door and she recognized Peter's voice and she overjoyed, ran back without opening and exclaimed, Peter's at the door, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind. He's locked up tight. He's gonna be killed tomorrow. She kept insisting he's at the door. 
Well, it must be his angel then. But Peter kept knocking. They opened the door and they saw Peter. They were astonished because they knew what kind of condition he was locked up. When Peter arrived at Mary's house, the followers of Yeshua were still praying. They had been up all night, long praying. I don't know what they were praying about. I haven't a clue if they were praying for Peter to be comfortable, for the living conditions to be amicable, or for Harold not to kill Peter. I could take a wild guess and say that I don't think they were praying for Peter's release because when he showed up at the door, they were they couldn't believe the young lady. He's here. Quite the opposite. They said, you're out of your mind. The followers of Yeshua were praying, but they weren't praying for expectation. We need to pray with expectation. Now don't take that wrong. I do not desire to join the ranks of those preachers who say, just ask God what your heart desires and he will give it to you. What I'm saying is this, when you come to know the desires of Yahweh's heart in your situation, ask for him to move in the situation and pray with expectations, this is where most of us get sidetracked and frustrated in our prayers. I know because I've done it more times than I care to remember. All too often I begin praying about a situation before I come to understand Yahweh's desire for that particular situation. I jump into the pool of prayer asking for Yahweh to do what I want him to do for me. We need to know what we should be praying for when we call upon Yahweh. We need to be like little boys who had been sent to his room because he had been bad. A short time later he came out and said to his mother, I've been thinking about what I did and I said a prayer. That's fine, she says. If you ask, he will help you. Oh, I didn't ask him to help me. Be good, replied the boy. I asked him to help you put up with me. That little boy knew how to pray. We need to know how to pray as well. We can find a good example of what I'm talking about from the life of Yeshua. We can find a good example. When Yeshua was getting ready to face the stake, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And while he was praying at the the torch, about the torture and excruciating pain that he would be getting ready to face, Yeshua prayed in Matthew 26, verse 39, My Father, if it is possible, make this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42, he went on the second time and prayed, My father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, your will be done. You sure didn't want to die the horrible, the horrible death that was waiting for him. But he desired Yahweh's will for his life more than he desired his comfort. When difficult situations come about in our lives and we seek Yahweh's help in prayer, we automatically conclude that it is Yahweh's will for us to avoid pain and suffering or even death. We may very well conclude wrongly and miss Yahweh's best for us in this situation. Someone might ask, if I, can, can, if I can't rest in the fact that what Yahweh wants for me is what is easiest, then how can I know what to pray? There are times that we may not know what to pray, but when those times arise, we need to go to Yahweh in prayer. Tell him that we don't know how to pray, but we do desire his best for us. And the rest in the fact that Yahweh desires his best for us. If we will seek the heart of Yahweh, then the times of uncertainty in prayer will definitely be less than if we simply wander through life, never seeking to know Yahweh intimately. Let me give you an example. Children are always asking for things, 
But there are some things that they do not ask parents to do or give them because they know their parents. They also know that their parents desire what's best for them. If I am slicing an apple, a young kid will ask for the knife, but I am not going to give it to them because it might not be best for them. When they get older, they get to know you better than the young ones. Most of the time, they will know that you desire what is best for them, so they don't ask you to do things for them that could hurt them. They might ask to sit on your lap while you watch TV, and they know you will always say yes. They know that they can ask you for money to buy their mother a present, and you will give it to them. <coughs> they know you. They know not to ask you to play with a stick of dynamite because you won't give it to them. As they get older, they will still get to know you so that there are some things that they ask, for. sometimes that they ask for things you still have to say no. The longer they know you, the better they understand what you will permit or not. There are times that the younger child will ask for something and the older one will say, you know mom and dad won't do that. Parents are not saying no because they are some kind of tyrant. They are saying no to some things so they can say yes to even better things. Just as children need to get to know their parents in order to know how to ask for something, what to ask for, what not to ask for. We need to know our Heavenly Father so that we can know what he desires for us. Children are learning that parents desire to act in ways that demonstrate their love for them. And as I get to know Yahweh better, I will learn that he wants to act in ways that demonstrate his love to me. And I will ask him to act in like manner. I could say, well, surely Yahweh wants me to be famous because then I would be able to tell even more people about him. If Yahweh knows that I couldn't handle being famous, then why would he grant a prayer that would destroy me? <clears throat> well, surely Yahweh wants me to be healthy because then I could accomplish much. But what if in my good health I forget Yahweh? The more we get to know Yahweh, then better we will be prepared to pray with Yahweh's desire in mind. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, A Day in the Life of Ivan Dasunovich, he wrote, Ivan endures all the horrors of a Soviet prison camp. One day he's praying with his eyes closed when a fellow prisoner notices him and says with ridicule, Prayers won't help you get out of here any faster. Opening his eyes, Ivan answers, I do not pray to get out of prison, but to do the will of God. Isn't that great? I'm not praying for a life of ease, but I am praying for the will of Yahweh to be done through my life. Once we come to know Yahweh's desire, how we can best be used by Yahweh to bring him the glory and honor he so deserves, then we must pray with expectations. Do you pray expecting Yahweh to act? Do you pray and then when Yahweh shows up in your situation, you respond like the early believers by saying, you're out of your mind? When we pray, we need to say, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know how long. I don't know you will use the how you will use to uh, accomplish your will. But I know that you will act, and I will wait with expectations for your mighty hand to move. I've been baptized in '88. Twenty-eight years of prayer. 28 years of wondering if Yahweh was ever going to move. 28 years of asking, but surely as the years rolled along, the expectations of anything significant happened had to dwindle. 
Will my family be an extended family ever come to the truth of Yahweh? We need to pray with confidence that he is able. He is capable. And he is willing to do that which will bring him glory and honor. My prayer for you is that Yahweh might surprise you with the answer to all our prayers that you surrender your life to Messiah, repent, and be baptized in the name of Yahweh and his son, Yeshua, and allow him to surprise you with the gift of eternal life. Yahweh bless.